Hey guys, um, welcome to the third installment of the Property Lettings Playbook. Uh, you're here with me, Andy. I'm the head of marketing at Oasis Living. We've got Sam Gosh, who's the founder at Oasis Living. Yeah. Um, we've got Peter Littlewood at iHouse. Nice to be with you, Peter. Thanks for joining Hello, us. Nice to be with you as well. Thank you, Peter. Well, uh, so this is the third one that we're doing now, um, and I get to try out my new fancy microphone, which a second ago was not working. So <laughs> we'll see how we go. Um, but um, so what we tend to do, Peter, in this is just tell us about yourself and, and we'll just go from there. Um, and, and we just want to hear about what all about iHouse, all about you and your your history with the property market and the lessons market and what iHouse's place is within it. Um, so if you just want to do as a quick intro, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Well, iHouse is a land a trade association for landlords. Um, we've been around in one form or another since 1974. So, you know, we've got, we've got quite a good uh, following. Um, been through various different names. We settled on iHouse eventually, I for information, how to do things. So, you know, how to, to, to house people. So it's got a sort of a, a, a few meanings along the way, that, that name. Um, what we principally do is that we help and support landlord, our landlord members. We do that via, um, we've got a, a helpline that we use for members. Uh, we've also got uh, newsletters and uh, we do weekly newsletters, weekly email newsletters. Uh, we used to do a lot of meetings, but obviously they got knocked on the head 18 months or nearly two years ago, wasn't it? So, um, so we've been doing a lot of Zoom meetings. So I'm quite used to this. Uh, we also do the same as you, we, you know, we do um, uh, helpful videos for, for people and we put those on the website as well. So it's all about keeping people up to date, really. OK, cool. Um, so I was I was going through your website today and a bit of yesterday. And um, yeah. so we've had so I has this place really is sort of is that am I right in thinking it's there to help landlords and work with uh, local authorities uh, as sort of almost a non-profit, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, just like a, 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 a non-profit non body, yeah. Yes, so, yeah. Um, you know, we, we're not here to make huge profits for our directors or anything like that. I can assure you of that one. Um, so we are <laughs> principally here to uh, to help and support landlords. Um, we, we, as I said already, we make them aware of what's going on, but also we do try and step in and negotiate and discuss with local authorities and to a lesser extent central government um, we will help landlords where they need to take on court cases that tends to be with uh, tenants but we have supported cases against local authorities where we feel the local authority is being unfair we will also take part in consultations mainly with central government um, so as an example um, central government are doing uh, are putting together a white paper uh, that they promised in the Queen's speech oh, a few months ago now, um, which is supposed to come out in the autumn, it's running late uh, so you know we will take part in that and we will put a paper we put a paper together uh, with our views on that Oh okay cool, so you're existing as a sort of yeah uh, on the landlord side uh, if you know from from both government and from tenant side as well. So similar to, fairly similar, we had uh, Des uh, Taylor on the other week yep. um, from Landlord Licensing and Defence. So it's, it's yep. a, a, it, we're fair to say that that's a similar thing. It, it is. Des, Des concentrates on mainly licensing, but also where the council have done something which um, he believes is incorrect. And, you know, he will take on cases like that uh, we, we've got more of a general view, but yes, a, a lot of it has been licensing. So um, we uh, we have done. The only way you can challenge a license, a licensing application, is with a judicial review, and they're big and clunky and expensive. You know, mm. you, you, you're talking of a minimum of fifty thousand pounds, quite honestly. And wow. even if you win, you may not get your cost back. So uh, you know, it's, it's serious. It's a serious matter. So we've, we've done a few, we've won some, lost some, uh, but also sometimes the threat of a judicial review will help bring a, a, a local authority to a, a table and we can negotiate the thing, which is what we want to do anyway. Okay. Okay, great. And I, I might have a small technical question at this point. So I didn't know fully about the process of a judicial review versus 
a hearing in front of a planning inspectorate. So if there's a council, if they say, okay, well, there is something wrong you have done as a landlord, they will serve you a notice of some sort and it probably goes to a planning inspectorate. And how different is a ju judicial review from that process? Okay, they are separate matters. So a judicial review is is used to um, to say that you don't agree with the decision either a local authority or even the central government have made, um, okay. and you wish to go to the, the Supreme Court. Normally, okay. um, it can be a lower court, but it's normally a Supreme Court. Um, it's done in two stages. Uh, you have to apply for a judicial it's called a jr so you have to apply for, apply for a jr very quickly after a decision has been made you also need to have all your evidence in place as though you're going for the full review so you know that can be quite serious as well uh, you've got a very limited time to apply for the jr normally 12 weeks but to be quite honest with you they like it within four or five weeks, which is not long at all for, you know, get all your, get all your ducks in the row and uh, particularly yeah. get legal people on board as well. That will go before a judge who will decide whether you've got enough evidence and enough case to actually go for a full JR. Uh, if the judge agrees with that, and if the judge disagrees with it, you can appeal it, unless the judge, uh, this is a peculiar thing about uh, the law, if the judge says you can't appeal it, you can appeal it anyway. So <laughs> it's a really odd situation. Uh, but anyway, if you get permission to go before a full, full JR, that will happen. You can tidy up your evidence, but the bulk of your evidence has, has already been submitted. Um, you obviously can submit more evidence uh, if, if, if you think that the council's doing or the, the central government's doing um, other things apart from what you originally challenged. Uh, and it goes before a judge normally for a, a three-day hearing. Um, both sides present. The judge, uh, at some stage in the future, will come back and um, give their, their, their review. Okay. Which, and, and again, it can be appealed or not. Okay. So, but the, the point about if it, does, if it does go to the Supreme Court, the Supreme, the Supreme Court trumps everything. Um, so if the Supreme Court say X, Y, Z, that's the law. That's the law then. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and that change will be made to the law. I mean, just to, to and uh, I'll tell you something else for me, but just to go back to your, uh, if you're an individual landlord and you disagree with a, a license condition or even the re request to have a license uh, and you appeal, that will go to the, um, the, the tribunal and they will hear that case. It is the same tribunal that tends to hear planning appeals but, you know, it, they've got a slightly different hat on. Okay. Um, with that tribunal, what will happen there is, is I will say to people, don't be um, frightened of appealing something, but it's always worth looking at the tribunal and looking at their website, because you can look on the website and see the, if you find another case which mirrors yours, you need to look at what the tribunal said last time. Because mm -hmm. if the tribunal last time appeal, uh, found in favour against you, they're probably going to do the same again. Yeah, so just so, finding yeah. that legal precedent uh, yeah. Yeah. Before, before pursuing it further, okay. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, so, you know, it, it's, it's, just, it's all quite complicated, to be quite honest with you. But uh, and we, we try to negotiate. So, for instance, sticking with licensing for the moment, because it's a, it's a key subject, Um our attitude about licensing is it was brought in for a specific, specific reason. It was brought in under the 2004 Housing Act, and uh, it was brought in for a local authority to be able to use if they believed that the, um, a, a property was being poorly managed and they could license that property or properties around it. And uh, the manager of that property, normally the landlord, would have to apply for a license, which normally would get accepted, but then they would have certain conditions imposed upon them, normally management conditions. If they failed to meet those management conditions, the ultimate was that the license could be withdrawn from that, that manager. Now, a new manager could apply, or the property would have to be taken off the, the rental market. 
Mm. That's what it's that's what it's originally intended for, and we've got no problems with that. What we've got problems with is where a local authority uses it wholesale to um, license a complete borough. Say, clearly they're doing it for uh, bu budgeting purposes, which is not what it's intended for. Yeah, I mean you're talking millions of pounds. Um, uh, Croydon had a, I think it's Croydon it was somewhere anyway, had a, a, a an application turned down. And their immediate complaint was, well, that's made a £22 million hole in our budget. That's mm. not what it's there for. It's yeah. there to control errant landlords. Yeah. And Nick, can you just go through, I mean, if you can, um, like why, why do you think or how are they using it for budgeting purposes? So is it cost for the licence or is it cost for, you know, how, how, just go into a little bit more detail on that if you're able to. Well, um, the theory is, is that uh, a license holder has to apply for a license for which they pay, and it varies, varies considerably, but normally it's around £1,000 a license for five years per okay. property, per property, per manager. Um, for that, what's supposed to happen is that the, the local authority is supposed to inspect the property to ensure it is up to scratch. Now, unfortunately, frequently they don't inspect the property so they'll take the money and they'll say well we've improved property conditions because we've raised x number of um fines or court orders or whatever all too frequently the the reason that they find a landlord is because they've not applied for the license which in our view isn't improving the the property condition we've got no problems with improving property conditions and we've got no problems with a local authority um, finding or even dis dismissing someone from the, the private rental sector who's a poor landlord. Mm. And they are around, but they're in the minority. Yeah. And unfortunately, the minority gives the majority uh, a bad reputation. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Um, I see a lot of this chat on the, the forums and things that I'm on online uh, that are full of, full of uh, land, landlords. And you do, you know, before I was in this business, you, you do, there is a, a lot of, on the tenant side being, an, I'm not a tenant anymore, I, I've just bought my first house. But yep. when I was a tenant, there tends to be a, a bit of a, a bad name for landlords in general, uh, mm -hmm. which does not, it is not accurate uh, in, in yeah. my, my experience, it would being in this industry more, more deeply. Um, in fact, most of the forums and things that I'm on, they'll call out these erroneous one and once in a lifetime or once in a while cases where a landlord has uh, acted uh, inappropriately um, and they'll call it out and you'll see, you'll see that the, the community does rue those people, that rue that, that kind of behavior. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, to I totally agree with you that, yeah, it's uh, tiring everyone with the same brush is not exactly fair. No, um, no, not at all. So, I mean, I don't know if you, uh, I'm just trying to think, um, a lot, as a lot of our listeners hopefully will be sort of starting out, there might be some, like, what, what advice would you give to a, a first-time uh, buy-to-let landlord or a HMO, um, someone that's wanting to get into HMO or, or, or just start renting out any property and, and start getting on uh, getting into this business sort of part or full time? Well, you use the word there, business. Treat it like a business. Don't treat it like a hobby. Treat it correctly. Um, we always say to landlords, whether you've got one or a thousand, you've still got the same responsibilities. You may be spending more or less time on the, uh, the management, but it is, it is someone's home that you're uh, offering and providing and then hopefully managing correctly. Um, so first of all, get trained to know everything that goes on. I know Sam did a, a training course with us. I think you'll say, Sam, that there's, there's a lot to know, isn't there? So uh, quite frankly, um, so you need to know what you're getting into before you get into it. Uh, I had a conversation yesterday, funny enough, many, many years ago, um, I thought about getting into bed and breakfast and I went on a training course and the guy said, right, I'm going to try and put you off because, quite frankly, you should only be doing this if you know what you're doing. And, in fact, he did put me off. <laughs> and we, we would like to do the same. You know, we like to train people so they know what they're doing. We do have potential landlords on our courses. And sometimes they say, right, OK, this is more to this than we thought. We're not going to get into it. We're going to find some other way of earning an income. 
good. We've, we've done our job correctly. So make sure you know what you're doing. Make sure you understand your market. So um, if you're looking for, say, for sake of argument, a student let, then make sure that there is a market for student lets in that area and you're, you're uh, providing the appropriate property. Um, if you're not going to do student lets, if you're going to do a straight let to a family, again, make sure that, that there's the market. If you're going to get into HMOs, and this covers student lets as well, then do understand HMOs is a, is a bigger job than a, a straight let. Um, it's got, it, it earns more income, but it's got far more management associated with it. Now, again, people who understand HMOs and in particular student lets, they know exactly what they're doing with it and they get on with it. So mm -hmm. I mean, stick with the student lets for the moment. Um, why a lot of student landlords like student lets is that because they've got the whole year mapped out for them. So they know when they can go on holiday, they, they know when they can do work to the property, etc, etc, etc. They know during the summer they're going to be full out manic and that's not going to stop till Christmas. Yeah. And then they're going to have a couple of months of doing very little and then they're going to be back on with it again. Mm. So, you know, they, they like it. A lot of people don't like that. So, you know, it is, it's understand your market. The other thing I would say, and I hope Sam will back me up on this one, is um, know your tenant. Make sure that you, you're going to get a good tenant. So when you uh, view tenants, make sure, please make sure that you reference them and check them and credit check them, et cetera, et cetera, and make sure that you are completely comfortable and especially where a lot of landlords, unfortunately, will rush that process if they've got a void. And we always say to them, well, a void's not very nice, but it's better to have a void at the beginning of the tenancy and lose a small amount of money than to have someone who goes into the property, stops paying the rent, and it takes you months and months and months to get them out with no rent. Yeah, so, and there's the risk that they're not a great tenant and they yeah. leave the place in a in a in a in a, in a horrible way yeah. when they yeah. leave. So then you've just doubled your void time at the other end of the tenancy anyway. Yep, yep. I mean, we, again, we will also say, do look at insurances. You know, you can get rent guarantee insurance. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and the point about rent guarantee insurance is that they will do credit checks on that uh, that potential tenant. And they will decide whether or not that you need a guarantor or not. So, you know, do look at rent guarantee insurance. Um, and also, unless you want to be a, a, a 24 hours hand on landlord, 365 days a year, then look at getting, I always describe it as like the AA type insurance for landlords, whereby a, a tenant can ring up a number and get maintenance done. Because again, if a tenant has a huge problem in the middle of the night on Saturday night, they've lost their key or whatever, can you cope with it? You know, if you can't cope with it, you shouldn't be there, shouldn't be doing this. Mm. So you, you can consider an agent for this kind of thing as well. And if you're going to consider an agent, make sure that the agent is a, a fit and proper person. Um, they know what they're doing, preferably belong to a trade body. Uh, and, you know, you're not going to have aggravation with them. And then the last thing I would say on this is if you do use an agent, um, I actually think the most important bit of paper in the letting industry is the contract between the owner of the property and the agent. Because the contract between the, the, uh, the agent or the landlord and the tenant is uh, described in law. So even if you don't have a paper contract, most of it's there already, there's nothing described in law between the, uh, the agent and the landlord. And so often we get um, landlords on saying, my agent is not done X, Y, Z, should they? The answer is very simple. Well, were they contracted to do X, Y, Z? If they were, they're not going to do it. Mm. Because this is very different from uh, the, the implicit contract that a landlord and a tenant has, where even if there are gaps in the documentation, yep. the law is built in a way that it will yep. fill up the gaps, but that's not the case, which is why it's vitally important that the landlord and the letting agent has a watertight document in place. Well, it's not only watertight, it's um, so that everybody knows who's doing what. Right. 
Um, so there's nothing worse for a tenant. Then there's a list of things to be done. You get that where you know there's a gap in the middle, or possibly even worse, you get that. Mm. Where you know that both parties are trying to do the same thing. It just drives the tenant mad. So it's really, really important to know who's doing what and what what everyone's signed up for, for the agent's point of view and for the landlord's point of view and for the tenant's point of view. So, you know, really important for that, quite frankly. So good takeaways from this really are for our listeners. Uh, you know, firstly, you touched on them a while back that it's, it's not it's not like a qu- get rich quick scheme becoming yeah. a landlord, especially if you want to self-manage uh, because there's obviously, you've detailed beautifully like some pretty intense uh, stuff that you're going to have to deal with. And, you know, with the, the, the words 24 seven was, <laughs> was thrown around. So there's obviously a, a lot to consider if you want to get into this. And when you are in it, you need to know, like you say, know your strengths. And, and if you need an agent uh, or, and you, you know, if you like being in property, but you don't want to deal with it all the time, then probably an agent's something that you need to look for as long as they're the right agent, you know, because you are trusting this person with essentially trusting your person with the management of your property. So and it's your asset. Um, we talked on a podcast before about how um, it's, you know, it's, it can be an inheritance or, or it's your financial asset. So you need to make sure that whoever you decide to work with is on your side um, and on the side of the tenant, but also is going to protect your, um, your investment and, and make sure that you get the best value out of it possible. Yeah. And I mean, also, uh, even if you decide to be a, a, a full-time manager, are you never going to be ill? Are you never going to go on holiday? So there are times when you may well want a, an agent to be a full-time agent for, say, two or three weeks of the year, just while you go on holiday. And they can handle, they, they won't get into anything major, but they can handle the calls. Uh, if there's maintenance issues, they're, they're urgent, they can deal with that. And they can deal with the perennial one, as Sam will probably tell you, lost keys. Mm. That's one that seems to come up all the time. Uh, you know, keys lost at uh, some ungodly hour during the night. Yeah. I did that once uh, in my last rental. I my my wife's family lived in the same town, but it was the one day that they were traveling away, um, and I went out to put something in the bin uh, in nothing but my pajamas, and the door shut behind me, and I didn't have a key, and yeah. I, <laughs> and my wife is away on a business trip, and I had to wait something like four or five hours and to just go to the local pub in my pajamas. <laughs> in my pajamas and just wait so yeah I've, i feel the pain of uh, anyone that's lost their keys or couldn't get into their property when they needed to yeah i mean you don't do what a friend of mine did was it uh, he did exactly that locked himself out unfortunately he locked himself out with a hammer so he broke the door down <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, i suppose there's one why way. did you do that why did you why did you ring somebody ah oh, that's a good idea well it's just cost you a fortune isn't it jeez <laughs> <laughs> oh, Oh yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for detailing all that. It's, I mean, if you've, so if, if people wanted to get in touch with you, um, or, you know, when would you, when would you recommend that someone gets in touch with you and how do they do that? What's the best way to get in touch with you? Well, you can go on our website so you can see it behind me. I'll move slightly. iHouse.uk. So you can see it there with the, uh, and we'll make okay, sure so to put that in the description of the podcast, which will be on yeah. all, all okay. the iHouse.uk is probably the best way, quite frankly. Um, but uh, info at iHouse.uk will we'll, we'll email us. So cool. that, that's the easiest way of doing it. And there's, but, um, there's a, is there a membership? Did I see on the website there's a membership as well? Yeah, there's a membership fee. So uh, the, the um, helpline and the, uh, the weekly email, etc., is available to members. Whilst we're not for profit, we obviously do have costs to run. And um, so, you know, that, that's how we do it. So the membership fee is £75 per annum, tax deductible. Where can you get a year's worth of legal advice for £75? And very, you can't. Really priced. Very, yeah. very. Yeah, that's what I thought when I was on there, because I, I, I was sort of looking through and seeing all the advice. And Sam, I know Sam sent me some stuff Um on it um i'm not i'm not a current member um so i couldn't get access but i've seen some of the the, the stuff that you have is very good i would say really yeah good. it's I really know. helpful i've i've read through some of the stuff that sam sent me and it's well worth the uh the, the small fee for um for getting that advice and that security of someone else give it like fighting your corner for you 
Yeah, I mean, as, I'll give you a small example. Um, since we've had COVID, the eviction process has changed, well, considerably changed, I think, four times. Mm -hmm. Now, it's going to change again on October the 1st. We have told our members that, and when the new forms come out, and there's new forms as well, so if you use the old form, uh, it'll probably get thrown out at court. So again, that's the kind of thing that we do. So on October the 1st, the, the ministry, which they've just renamed themselves, but the housing ministry, um, have shown us what the forms are going to look like, but not they're not the correct forms. They always make them available on the day. <laughs> I don't know why they do that, but they always make them available on the day. So on the day, we will put it on our website. Yeah, right. that's what we do for our members. And we will tell our members, don't from here on in, don't use the old one that you may have. So that's just a small example. Yeah, but it's a it's a small example, but it's a it's a pretty a pretty huge impact um yeah. on somebody, you know, somebody that's maybe like you say, very busy with all their properties to get an email drop in that says, do this right now, then it's it it really takes that stress out of it. So it's it's yeah, it's definitely worth worth looking into that for any of our listeners that are are thinking uh, that they need a little bit more help with their properties. Um, all right, well, we'll finish up there, I think. Um, but thank you. I'll make sure that all the links uh, of anything relevant and, and your site and how to get in touch with you are all in the description. So that'll be on YouTube and Spotify and, and Stitcher and all the other places that we've put the podcast. Um, but thank you so much, Peter, for joining us. Uh, we really no, appreciate thank it. Thank you very much, Peter. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Cool. All right, guys, uh, we'll see you next time for episode four. Um, but for now, uh, it's goodbye from all of us. Bye. Bye.